Welcome to the Ottawa International Writers' Festival. My name is Sean, I'm the festival's artistic director, and we are broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. And on behalf of our partners at Library and Archives Canada and the Ottawa Public Library, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's launch for Love After the End. It's hard to imagine, but in an alternate universe, this evening would have been the opening night of the festival's fall edition, and we would perhaps be gathered in person to kick off a week-long celebration. While we are missing the community contact and the chance conversations and interactions that used to be such an important part of our lives, I'm profoundly grateful that we are still in a position to celebrate great writing, and tonight, to imagine what tomorrow might bring. One of our community partners, Quart, the Ottawa Queer Arts Collected, wanted us to highlight the work of the Association of Seven Generations. A7G is an Indigenous-owned, grassroots, youth-led, youth-driven, nonprofit organization focused on cultural support and empowerment programs for Indigenous youth. This fall and winter, A7G are connecting with youth by offering virtual language lessons on Thursdays and virtual youth gatherings for Indigenous youth on Fridays. Please go to a7g.ca for more resources and links. I also want to thank you all for supporting authors and booksellers through these difficult times. Our official bookseller is Perfect Books on Elgin Street, but wherever you are right now, there's an independent bookseller nearby or online who would be more than happy to sell you a copy of this book, as well as work by any of the authors we've been lucky enough to connect with virtually this season. We've seen now how hundreds of years of colonial violence continues to dehumanize and disenfranchise indigenous communities, how that legacy continues to destroy the environment, how the smallest concession to indigenous sovereignty leads to howls of protest like we're seeing with the lobster fishery. But we are also now seeing that the future, if there is to be one, will not be a Jetson style monoculture of extractive capitalism and 1950s cis het norms. It's going to be a lot more interesting than that. I'm so grateful to be playing a small part in welcoming this amazing anthology into the world. Our host tonight is Joshua Whitehead, who is the editor of Love After the End. This is Joshua's third appearance at the festival. We were lucky to host him as a poet with Full Metal Indigiqueer, then as a novelist with Johnny Appleseed, and tonight we are blessed to have him back, this time as an editor and our host. Let's give a warm virtual welcome to Joshua Whitehead. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to first and foremost thank uh, Auto Writers Fest for having me again. I'm sad we can't be all visiting um, in the lovely little city that you have, but this is also works just as fine, I think. Um, I'm so happy and honored to be here with three of my amazing contributors, Naz Batam, Jay Simpson, and Adam Garnett Jones, who I'll be introducing momentarily. Um, so what we're going to do for tonight is I'll in introduce each of my contributors. Um, they'll be offering you a short sampling of the reading, something sweet, something supple to take home with you. Um, and then we'll be jumping into a discussion between us four, but I'm also, we'd love to hear questions from you. So if, if you can see on your Zoom is a little Q&A box just on the bottom. If you want to click that, if you have any questions, pop them in there, I'll see them. And hopefully we'll get to some, if not all of those tonight. So bring your questions as they come, throw them at me. Um, so it's my great honor to be introducing all three of these writers. Uh, and first and foremost, I would like to introduce Nazba Tom, um, who's a Diné as a som and a somatic pr practitioner. They support individuals and groups through a process of embodied transformation using a combination of conversation, breath work, new skills, body work, and gestures. Their work aims to humanize and reconnect us to ourselves, to each other, and to our land. In between working with individuals and groups, they do their best to capture poems and short stories haunting them at all hours of the day. Uh, and it's a great honor again to be bringing Nazwe here, reading from their story, Nameless. So I'll hand it over. Thank you so much, Joshua. Um, and thank you so much to the Ottawa Writers Festival to um, bring us in and to have us share our writing with all of you. Um, so I'm reading from uh, my short story called Nameless. Um, and this particular piece here is um, uh, around um, an elder, a Um She's teaching eh, who's her apprentice, um, how to travel as I call it. So, um, and it's really just about collapsing time and space here. 
Um, so I'll just read a little um, excerpt here and hopefully you like it. <clears throat> okay, let's begin. Get comfortable in your chair. Ready? She looked right into Ke's eyes with her eyebrows raised. Ke nodded and took in a deep breath. Oh, the first thing we will do is slow everything down with our breath and attention. She slowly raised her hand from her lap to the height of her head with an in-breath and lowered her hand with an even slower out-breath. She did this for 10 minutes, all the while Ke found themselves getting sleepier and sleepier. Try to stay in both the here and now and the dream world. That is the doorway. With eyes half closed and body half present, Ke nodded their head slowly and followed Asanhashke's hand rising and falling. As her hand slowed down even more, she started asking them questions. Where are we now? Uh, sitting in a truck playing with some keys or do you see me? You're, you're off to the left side of me. What am I wearing? Eh, let their eyes close to concentrate more. You have on gray pants, light brown or a cream colored shirt and a jacket. What else do you see? The inside of the truck, uh, the keys in my hand and we're in front of a house. It's, it's blue and has white trim on the windows with flower boxes underneath the windows. I feel like I know the people in the house. Wait, the, the image is dissolving away. It's okay, stay with me. I'll see you inside. Ke's eyes fluttered open and for a split second saw Asan Hashke with her hand on the table and her eyes rapidly darting back and forth beneath her eyelids as if in a trance. Asan Hashke called Ke back into the dream and Ke followed by closing their eyes. Where are we now? There's a, a sink to my left and, and your right. Uh, why, why can't I see your face? Try not to focus on that too much. I can feel you in the space. Focus on that sensing. Relax yourself a little more. Okay, am I dreaming? You're traveling now, keep going. I know we're just outside and, and now I'm here with you standing in front of me and I still can't see your face, but you have on the same clothes and you have to head out somewhere. Uh, this is so strange to tell you that I just dreamt about you while we were traveling. I mean, we're, we're traveling together. I'm, I'm following you. Uh, they're the same. The only difference is we know how to do this on purpose. I'm going to go now and you'll wake up soon. Thank you. Mm. I was just rereading this before, like rereading everyone's, and it's just it's so beautiful to hear it in your voices. Um, oh, I can't wait to talk about this piece. I got lots to say. <laughs> um, and also that's why I was just like laughing uh, at the Instagram pic that was on, and then you're like, perfect little setup in the corner. <laughs> so say hi to Catherine Hernandez for me. <laughs> I will. Yeah, she's actually watching right here. <laughs> Cash was <says> hi. <laughs> I had to out you a little bit. <laughs> um, next, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce Jay Simpson, who I haven't seen in a minute. So I'm so excited to be like virtually reconnecting uh, in this space and to see your beautiful face. Um, so Jay Simpson is an OG Cree Soto in Digicreer whose roots hail from the Sapotewayak, Kisigus, and Squanin Cree nations. They are published in several magazines, including Poetry is Dead, this magazine, Prism International, Sad Meg, Guts, Subterrain Grain, Subterrain Grain, and Room. They are in two Arsenal Paul Press anthologies, Hustling Verse 2019 and Love After the End this year. Uh, their newest book, which is so exciting that it's out in the world now, it was never going to be okay, just came out with Nightwood Edition. So please do check that out. Uh, it's, yeah, my great honor to bring to the stage the inevitable and the lovely and the majestic Jay. Anine, uh, <laughs> so good to see you. Your hair is so long since I saw you last year at Banff. Um, that was quite a journey where you took me to the ER. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <It's been a> <laughs> <minute>. <laughs> 
It's been a minute. Oh my God. I'm uh, starstruck by the panelists and also people in the audience. I, I miss in-person events so much. So this, I'm going to read a little bit of the arc of the turtle's back. <clears throat> Dagib comes home in a transport van when I'm out among the prairie fire in Odamum, collecting the sweet and small hearts for preserves. She looks good, hair pressed and cheeks peach with powder. Manadu, how I miss using blush, but how wasteful it is for me to crush these plants and to die to do so. That Gib uses, has this urgency, this drive, and begs us to pack up, telling us to gather only necessities and to leave the supplies and loved things behind. That Gib checks her phone constantly, breathes a sigh of relief when it only took us 20 minutes to gather our lives all up in two small suitcases and groans when I bring my bundle, hand drum and all. Naminson, sister, come on, we don't have time for this. The convoy is ready to leave and we're six hours to the city, she urges. I tut at her as I pull down the photo of Kokowa from the wall to put in the bundle bag. Kokowa didn't return home after five generations of displacement and kidnapping for you to rush us out of here, I snap at her. Gokowa didn't run away from the reserve at the age of 14 to go to the city to experiment with strangers and figure out their gender identity. The gib waves her arm in a circle at my body, rushing me out the door. I let the words sting as Gwiwidin and Ash take their seats in the middle of the van, Axel getting in behind them looking concerned. The driver is youngish, from six by the looks of it. He places a hand on top of the gibbs, shaking one as he, she slides into the front. I take a seat beside Axel. He slips his hand atop of my lap and I let him kiss my shoulder. We meet up at the convoy at Auntie Lee's. There's a team there for us. I can fill you in once, the, once we're there, but for now, please have faith in me, sister. The Gib states simply, forcing us into complacency, which by now we're used to out of fear of the new Indian agents stealing our bodies for their mining and settlement camps off planet. The truck rumbles, unaccustomed to the unpaved roads of the reservation. Gawidin grumbles about xerographic novel collection and being awake. Zay is usually asleep during the day, especially in the heat of July. The van's air conditioning is on full blast and I can see the gib still perspiring. Something else is up. Why go to the city? Metropolises weren't exactly the safest place for us as a very queer and very indigenous family trying to hide from the new Indian agents. Auntie Lee's convenience store is ahead of us, attached to the band office and the hall. I see similar looking vans idling with business looking indigenous folks standing nearby, having what I can only describe as disconcerting looks on their faces. As our van pulls up, the gib is already opening the door, shooting a warning glare at me half asserting her dominance and half asking me to stay put. She should know better by now. Kokoa did raise both of us. Thank you, Jay. Uh, again, it's just so beautiful to hear your voices. There's an insult in your story where your main character says, if they get them mad enough that they're gonna drop a house on them. Uh, and I was like, I need to bring that into my regular everyday lexicon. <laughs> it's quite a threat. Um, there's also a scene where your main character is wearing um, the moon medallion, the moon cycle medallion. And that's like the staple, I think of Jay, when I first met you, you had that on. So I, when I see that, I always picture you. So thank you. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Adam Garnett Jones. Um, Adam is Cree, Métis and Danish and a two spirit screenwriter, a director, a bead worker and a novelist from Edmonton. And let me just say, I'm also wearing Adam's beadwork that he made for me, <laughs> which got a bunch of memes on like Instagram. People be like, that's a weird bead. And I was like, this is one of my favorite medallions. <laughs> uh, so wonderful beadwork artist. Adam came into his own as a filmmaker with the release of his feature film feature, Fire Song, at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2015. Fire Song went on to win the Audience Choice Award at the Imaginative before picking up three more Audience Choice Awards and two jury prizes for Best Film at other festivals. Before going into production, the script for Fire Song won the Writers Guild of Canada's Jim Burt Screenwriting Prize. 
Adam is now focusing on writing fiction and creating custom beadwork. Again, I need to shout that out. Primarily for Indigenous artists and also runs a beadwork, a BYOB, Bring Your Own Beads, a beadwork group. Um, so do check that out. Uh, again, and just, I'm so happy to have us all here. Adam Garnet Jones, folks. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thanks so much for for having me, and thank you. It's a shout out to my to my beadwork group. I was actually just in in the the group earlier tonight um, because I accidentally double booked myself. Um, it's it's the times we times we live in. So um, I guess I will just begin by by reading my my piece. Um, it, it, was, it was great to hear the last last two pieces. Mine uh, also begins with a, a, a leaving. Um, so this is from the, the beginning of the story. When we packed to leave for the very last time, it didn't feel like the end. There was too much to think about. The three of us took our last steps out the door and into the small glazed air of the city. I gave a nod to the round-bellied man stripping siding from the house a warning that he and his crew of city salvage workers had better stay outside until they were good and gone. I took a Setsuan's hand and pulled her past the men. <clears throat> her little legs fluttered in double time to keep up. All down the street, she kept twisting her head, twisting her head around to look as if the house would still be hers as long as she held it in sight. Thor was way ahead of us. Strident fear propelled her beyond our reach. I glanced back before we turned the corner. Silvery trunks of maples, all dead since last year, stood like gravestones in front of the empty houses. Where will we bury our dead in the new world, I wondered. The salvage crew disappeared into our house with heavy plastic bags and crowbars. Th Thora was a block away, flapping her hands for us to hurry up. I started skipping, dragging a Setsuan behind me until we caught up. Thora maintained her pace, groaning about the wobbling left wheel of her luggage. She cursed the day's early heat and fretted that the bottles of filtered water wouldn't last until we arrived. I made sympathetic sounds as required. The airing of small complaints was how she mapped her world. As if enumerating the flaws in her surroundings reminded her that she was still alive and that time continued to pass her by. My own misgivings about Thora had long since given way to a kind of gratitude. The daily pattern of her moans, clicks and sighs were a comfort a rhythm that bound our days together. Years ago, if someone saw us, if someone saw us taking us off down the street like this, luggage in hand, they would have assumed that we were hitting the road for a weekend in Montreal or taking a trip out west perhaps. But flying wasn't something that regular people could do anymore. The only ones to take off now, suitcases in hand, were taking flight, escaping Earth. Over the past two years, Information about the new world had come to us without warning in massive intermittent data dumps. News organizations and citizen scientists mined it all for scraps that might seem important or interesting to the general public. From them, we learned that on average, the weather on the new world would be two degrees colder than Earth. We heard that the ocean currents were different, even though the land masses of both planets were me near mirror images of one another. Pundits and politicians used vague searching metaphors telling us over and over again that the planets were like identical twins, at once the same and altogether different. Twins share a womb, I thought. They grow from the same mother. I waited for the politicians and scientists to concede the existence of a grand mother of universes, but no such announcement came. Instead, we learned that in the new world, a tottering penguin-like bird, but with enormous blue eyes like polished stones lives at the South Pole. They also told us that although many primates occupy the twin planet, no humans could be found. None of the species they had encountered showed any evidence that they possessed intelligence or self-awareness beyond that which could be expected from a crow or a dog. But crows have funerals, I remembered. Dogs will always find their way home. Still, the scientists were keen to report that the planet was without buildings, monuments, or systems of writing. No history at all. A miracle. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. 
Uh, okay, I'm so excited to jump into conversation with all of you. <laughs> so let's get to like Gab and like aunties. Um, Best part. Yeah, I think so. It's like we're in the bingo hall. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're about to go get a Pepsi and a hot dog, you know, nice. big chips. <laughs> dollar combo. <laughs> <laughs> you know maybe some 50 50s um <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting so each of your stories have worlds that are in various different space, like times and spaces of collapse and uh, by your, your community here has like had to go underground after another a world war um adam and jay both of your worlds are on the like the edge of deterioration from extraction from global warming um and everything else that kind of comes with those systemic issues whereas and then jay's story your characters leave earth uh, and then adams your characters choose to stay and then in nasbaz yours is moving in between generations mm -hmm. um so like i'm sure we're all aware that the world is burning dying right now um so i'm interested in hearing a little bit about yeah, like what does utopia mean for you or your characters? Like, why did you put them into these scenarios or situations that you did? Hmm. Or what does it, utopia mean to you even? Yeah. It's funny, I, when I, so I, I don't, I don't know what everybody's like status in, in this book is, uh, but I saw, I saw the call for this book on Facebook um, for, for, for pitches and I had written a novel and I didn't have any short stories and I was like, oh, okay, like I could, I can, I can think about this. Like what would, what would my take on, you know, a, a fantasy utopia something be and I, and I, love speculative fiction and and was thinking a lot about um how a lot of it is about creating new worlds and and thinking about new worlds and and different places and, and about humanity <clears throat> moving from one place to another um and that for me really led to um just think thinking about how how much we depend on humanity and 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 i think that maybe um European people depend on the idea of like always going somewhere new. Um, even even like Western narratives, like like the, the classic Western depends on the, the idea of like expanding West into this, this like unknown uninhabited territory and how that's always at the expense of indigenous peoples. And so thinking about that in terms of like a fantasy science fiction context that, that created a question for me about like the ethics of an indigenous person becoming a colonizer potentially and how they would think yeah. through that um and so anyway that's that's kind of how i ar arrived at that question of just thinking like where where is where is my place and maybe you know where is all of our our places in in this kind of writing which is like i think that that fantasy writing and speculative fiction um tends to has a tendency toward colonialism and so to to mm -hmm. think about that and and unpack that um uh you know it was a good time <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i guess i'll just preface too so love after the end is actually a second iteration of this book the first was with the now closed bedside press um so i came into this already the contributors were already chosen i was just the editor the press went under uh, and then we spearheaded it to Arsenal, who thank you so much for giving this a uh, new home. Um, but when I was approached, it was, so this is also a secondary uh, um, inclusion into this maybe series of Indigenous Queer 2SQ speculative fiction. Originally it was supposed to be dystopian. And I was like, why are we always writing about dystopias? Like we live in dystopias. These are speculative fiction stories that sound way too true right now. It's way too real, scarily true. Uh, so was, I wanted to was like, let's think about utopias, like let's think about our joy and our success and our thriving rather than continually like pursuing like pain or trauma or like, again, dystopia, we as indigenous peoples right now is a dystopian present, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just as a preface, it says yes to why I was like interested in your just, like, ideas around utopia or joy even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... I think kind of going off of what Adam was just mentioning about like, um, like what does it mean to 
uh, interrogate, like, and maybe like embodying colonizing, but also to learn to disembody that. Um, and uh, I was thinking about, you know, there's so many times that we're always looking out and to a new place, right? To that person, but not to the folks who are already there. Um, and I think a, a space that I'm always curious about is what, what happens if that new terrain is actually within. Um, and then also that new terrain is the lens that often many of us have to leave, right? Um, in order to pursue education, work, you know, partnership, all these things. Um, and I think for many of us, um, there is such a yearning and a longing to return to those places. Um, and, uh, and I remember um, uh, uh, a lecturer at uh, U of T, Dr. Diane Millian talking about, you know, many of us will never return home. And so our work really is to take care of where we end up, you know, um, and so, and then also I just was thinking about uh, how can we um, use what's available to us then if we're not able to physically be home um, uh, to, to then really be in connection, right? Um, uh, with that. Uh, so, so that was sort of uh, my, my thinking around that. But I think with this, actually, the inspiration for this was just um, a lot of dreams I had where they felt so real, they felt so vivid, um, they were very lucid. Um, and the, the particular scene that I showed where as like, oh, you're wearing this and that. Um, uh, my aunt who's now deceased, actually that was her, like she was in mm -hmm. a Zan Hashkez, um position. Like I dreamt about her after she passed and, um, and it was in someone's trailer back home. <laughs> Um, and I couldn't see her face and I, I knew it was her and I was like, is that you? You know, we had a conversation um, and, you know, and that's a common occurrence for me is to talk with and communicate with relatives who've passed on. Um, and I was like, there's something here, like th there is some sort of collapse happening. Um, uh, and it's happened enough times that I'm like, you know, what's what's going on, you know, um, but then I was like, it's also a really fun you know, to, to imagine like, oh, if I could write a short story about it and if it was on purpose that I could do that and all these things, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So it was fun to, to imagine that and, and to really play with that. And then also to really be like, you know, as many indigenous communities have done, like they've survived sadly so many, um, so many attempted genocides uh, that we, we learn from those experiences and then we learn how to, you know, move through it better the next time, you know. Yeah. I mean, and there are stories of people from my community who did go into the canyons, into the walls there to hide mm -hmm. from um, Kit Carson and his army, um, you know, as he was uh, herding people over to Fort Sumner. Um, that's how they survived and they were never found. Um, so, and then there were the ones who did get captured, you know, and they, they were interned there and then they came home. So, you know, so there's a lot of collective knowledge there as well so it's like yeah we, we'll we'll get through this next thing you know mm. yeah thank you for that mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> i think for myself it is at times difficult to see a future and mm -hmm. um that has shifted tremendously given the nature of what I'm seeing in the next generation that has been safeguarded by folks of our generation and the generation before us, um, where I now really believe that the kids are okay. And it's in that belief that I, I began to dream more of a tomorrow where a utopia can exist and it's been a lot of like self-work also and like reflecting and uh, contemplating the work of Billy Ray Belcourt who talks about utopia quite a bit and um, the theory of it. And it's, it's really a lot of coping to try to um, figure out what utopia meant for me. But when I thought of 
the future I want. It has to be a future that isn't based in um, pseudo traditionalism and is based in futurisms that adapt and move like a river would through the land and how we have to move in that sense. Um, but as Adam said also with the idea of moving and Europeans wanting to go somewhere else and um, that kind of like hiding to stay in my short story, my main character doesn't want to leave. And it's through not her own choice that she actually is removed. And that was a very um, intentional decision because I had a discussion with Rem more so about like leaving. And then she said, she's like, none of my people and I, if given that choice would ever leave. And I thought about that and I was like, I just got my home territories back. Like I returned recently. Um, I met my aunties and, and my, my cookums and, you know, uh, heard the language um, speaking fluently. I don't think I would leave either if the world was, you know, if there was a choice to go elsewhere, I don't think I would leave either. The only thing is if it was um, when I was unaware. And um, I think that was something I had wanted to explore more and how for utopia necessity is is at most at times and it's very frightening no, I, I love those responses it's like and i think that's ingrained in all of your stories and like thinking about kinship and caretaking for the space as we're discussing here but also like i think everyone's asking and more specifically like adam and jay like thinking about the ethics of do we become colonizers too or do we enact those kind of systemic powers when we're in spaces right like even being here in Mokinstis or Treaty 7 as a Cree, OG Cree from Treaty 1, I'm also very aware that this is like, this is not my home. I'm just a participant and a caretaker in the space, right? And I don't think a lot of folks think about that in the spaces they move around. Like we, I think of what we do, obviously, as we name our spaces uh, and we recognize the sovereignty of our, of our nations, right? And yeah, so that's just, I like, love those ideas of like thinking about what utopia means, but also like sometimes the cost or the mourning of, of a utopia like that in any kind of grand sense. And maybe this too like leads into my next question, which I pose to all three of you. But I think everyone's stories are like, and I, this is why I was so excited to pair this trio, because I think your stories are all talking to one another. Uh, so I'm like Nazba, your protagonists, they speak to each other across generations, as I said um, earlier, and Adam, you, in this, even in the naming of your story, the history of the new world, you're talking about history of newness is like past and present, right? Um, as in with Nazbaz. And then in Jay, like yours is about bringing the past, like your earth into this new world that your characters are growing. Like they literally bring like the four medicines and they have this beautiful greenhouse in, this, in these arcs that they're on. Uh, and when I was like thinking about this question, I was doing a podcast for Tea House, which is the insurgent architects here at UFC, Larissa Lyrons. Uh, and I was editing a podcast with Christos who was giving an interview. Um, and Christos said this really amazing thing that's haunted me and stuck with me, um, wherein they narrated that we're always remembering the future. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that with all three of yours, just like how past and present um, and futurisms are all kind of braided together. Uh, and we all, we're all joking in COVID, like time's a construct, but I think BIPOC <laughs> folks and queer folk, we know that. <laughs> it's like, surprise, welcome. Um, so I'm interested, like, can you folks talk a little bit about like temporality and orality? Um, like how, do, how does time or generations or past, present and future function in your writing? And maybe even if you want to talk about this, how does temporality and orality uh, or time and storytelling function in your lives too. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay too. That's hard. I I think um <laughs> yeah you really just like threw us such a hard ball. Sorry, it's, you're all being tested and grading right now. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe just to simplify, so, like, past and present. Oh, I, I, I can share yeah. some of my thoughts around that. 
Um, it's a really good question. Um, and it reminds me of, uh, I introduced um, myself uh, traditionally once. So, you know, we, we uh, say, you know, I'm really just saying, hi, my name's Nazba. You know, this is my primary clan, which is my mom's clan. So it's maternal, you know, lineage, you know, and then my dad's clan and then my grandparents on both sides. Um, and uh, a teacher once mentioned like, oh, you're like a walking genealogy. Um, and I was like, yeah, I suppose I am, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and again, right, it helps locate if, if you're also another um, Diné person um, that they're like, oh, I know how to relate to you. It doesn't matter where we are, right? And then that's how you relate to them. Um, and so you end up, even if you're, you know, a little kid, you're someone's parent, you know, or a grandparent or or you end up becoming, you know, so all the things. Um, so that's, I think, one way that we're already taught that um, gen generations, like, sort of go back and forth, you know, there's an expansion contraction of it. Um, in the work I do, um, uh, when you talk about, we're always remembering the, the future, or wait, was it history you said? Uh, yeah, Christos said, we're always remembering the future. That's right. So the work I do as a somatics practitioner, one of the, like our treatment plan, right, that we, we how that gets developed is um, actually through what we call a commitment. So it's like your vision for the future, like where you want to be, right, you imagine it. And so in all the practices you do, you're actually remembering why you're doing those practices to get to where you want to get to. Mm. Right. So I guess in that way, there's a practicing into the future. You're remembering the future all the time. Right. Because you know where you've come from, um, that you're like, you know, I there's some skills there, but also I need new skills to get to this other place. Right. Um, so, so there's that happening already. Um, and then even just the work I do with people, um, again, as a practitioner, we play with time and space all the time um, that you're really with all the iterations of that person all the time. Um, that's who is driving their life until they learn to drive, right? <laughs> until they learn to be like in charge of themselves um, a bit more, right? They learn the skills to do that. And so with that, it's almost like not, you know, like let's say you were my person that I was working with Joshua. It's like Joshua and then little Joshua, you know? And then what we know about intergenerational trauma is like, and then your, el your ancestors, right? And then what kind of ancestor do you want to be? Right. So all those mm -hmm. things we're, we're holding all the time. Um, yeah. So and then there's just all the layers within yourself that we're holding as well. So I just I feel like I time travel all the time in my work. Um, and then that really influences the writing I do. Um, and, and it really um, uh, gives me a sense of also how do I orient where I am now? Right. Like mm. how how do we want to take care of this place that we're in now? And like you're saying, you know, I am I'm a a visitor here as well, you know, uh, Dene from what is currently the Southwest US, um, USA. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's. I feel like it's always with me and it, it was just something that we were told to remember all the time, being walking genealogies. Oh, I love that frame, like write that down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and consistently time traveling, I'm like, yes, let us all be biopunk mutants. Um, <laughs> Well, it's a very embodied exactly. thing we yeah. do, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely yeah. Uh, agree with Nasba. Um, even though I was in foster care, like I knew who my grandmas were, mm -hmm. I knew who my like grandparents were, like um, being able to name, and recently I've discovered more relations, being able to name myself, um, and my relations going almost to pre-contact is, is a very beautiful thing. Um, but I have always been a non-linear storyteller. Like it's just, I, as a kid, people hated listening to me at first because the tangents <laughs> that would go on. And like even even and and Evan Ducharme and Emily Riddle in the chat can attest to when I tell a story, I'm like, pause. For context, we need to go 12 years in the past, like, <laughs> and then like X, Y, Z, like my stories always have little asides and little footnotes. And I'm like, to get the full picture, you need to be here on February 27th, 
2013, like at this longitude and longitude. And I just need you to join me for two minutes to see, and then we'll come back and then you'll understand why I said this thing at this time. And um, even in my essay, essays, I always go down that route and I can't for the love of me even in creative writing courses, I could never get out of it. I just couldn't, it was just beyond me. And for a while, um, teachers and professors just said I was a distracted writer and incapable of telling stories in that way. But now on Netflix, all of the shows are nonlinear storytelling. Like think of The Witcher and like all of these things where it's like the past and the present and it's all intermingling and everyone's loving it, but it's just something that we just know and we just do. And it, it's it, like, people ask me how I do it all the time. And I'm like, that's just how my brain thinks. And, and that's just how it is. Very true. Like sometimes we're like, I'm, something funny happened to me last weekend and like sit down, but first I need to go back to 1492. <laughs> <laughs> right uh, i also just want to remind folks if you do have questions the little q a box is on the bottom plug them in there if you want but adam did you want to add anything to that or yeah after my saying that the question is too hard um man you're you're such uh like fully formed uh and wonderfully developed humans <laughs> i i was just thinking about um the question of temporality and and this story, but also just in, in terms of, of um, you know, the the life that I've lived and and realizing that um, as a queer person for like a lot of my life, I think that I spent time during my development, like removing myself from the timeline, um, kind of imagining myself as this person who is alone. Um, and in some ways, like a person alone without a context um, where I'm, I'm not going to have, uh, I'm not gonna have kids. I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to participate in kind of like the, 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 the structures of like family and cultural life in a way that um, the, the world at large is able to. And I, there's, there's lots of reasons why I, you know, uh, uh, sort of put all of that on, on myself um, and it's maybe through the process of like becoming, uh, becoming a parent and um, raising a small person and getting older, but I, I just feel like my understanding of, of time and my, my temporal sense is changed in such a, a strange and, and wonderful way where I, I feel like I can, you know, I see my stepdaughter now and I see who she was when she was like a, a, a tiny creature and then I look at her and I see like I just so clearly see who she is as a grown person and I and I talked to my grandma the other night and she was talking about when she was young and I just I just feel like I'm like as I as as I have become a parent I've kind of like re-entered time <laughs> and and not from any kind of a sense of like having an an ego in the way that like people invest in their kids but just feeling like i have permission to be um in the world a different in a different way and and participate in um participate in 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 culture and in family in in a different way and that's allowed me to kind of see <laughs> this this incredible uh, uh, circular vision of time um, in a way that I was never able to do when I when I was just you know trying trying to stand on my own um, yeah. and so so writing I guess you know connecting back to your question and you know about that that sense of um, time and generations in the story and in and in all of our stories I think that that's maybe what I was unconsciously tapping into and trying to, to, to write about and think about and, and, and yeah, just, just, just work through while I was writing. Yeah. Well, I think like the indigenous species in your new world, in your story, they're like, they're called the mermaids. Um, and they <laughs> like have this like haunting rhythm that 
people try to decipher, which basically I think comes down from paraphrasing, but your circle is not round. Um, and we all, I think, write in continuums and in circles, like with Johnny Appleseed, people are like, this, there's no plot here. I'm like, it's a photo album. <laughs> 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 but I think that's just how we naturally are, right? And I would even say like, you know, there's like Indian time, like, like we show up 30 minutes late. Uh, there's queer time, right? And 30? Think... That's early for you, Josh. <laughs> I know, never mind. <laughs> like, who am I kidding? It's like an hour and a half. <laughs> um, but I think, so there's like that, like uh, like Indian time, queer time, and that we're, I think, in the intersection of both. Um, so maybe I'll just ask this as my last question to you folks, but as like queer indigenous, queer indigenous folks, trans indigenous non-binary or two-spirited folks, how does, yeah, how does that like function in your stories? Cause I know like with all three of yours, um, whereas with Jay you're using Zizer pronouns and with Nazbaz you add an asterisk before the they, them. Um, and Adam and yours, I really, Thora, like the kind of wife of your main character M, that's like I just don't like. <laughs> um, but thinking about um, in, in your piece, like queer folks and relationships between. Um, so yeah, like I think as two spirited people or queer indigenous folks, trans indigenous folks, like we already embody time um, because one, we're not supposed to be here. Two, we've lost a lot of those kind of. Um, what we might consider now queer uh, ways of being within our linguistic systems, right? We're still, I think our communities are still very traumatized by same-sex sexual assault, which enforces homophobia and transphobia and femphobia. Um, or even thinking about queer history on Turtle Island, which doesn't just go back to like, you know, the queer rights movement, but our queerness arcs back to originality on this island, right? Um, so like, yeah, we are embodiments, walking genealogies, living vocabularies like that. So I guess the, yeah, what I'm interested in, in the, speaking about 2SQ-ness or um, and gender or sex or sexuality is, yeah, like what stylistic choices did you make in writing your pieces in terms of trying to empower um, queer or trans indigeneity? I think I'll throw in on that one. Um, <clears throat> when I first read like the the first anthology um, at the press that shall not be named, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, okay, I'm done. Uh, I I saw myself in a few of the works for the very first time, and when uh, we shared uh, a picture of a beverage called Vanji in Toronto and we were talking about this, Josh. Um, <laughs> it, was I, it was very, it was bright blue, so questionable. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, I was like, if like, you know, if, if this, if I get this work done on time, like if it, <laughs> I have a responsibility to ensure that the next generation feels seen and feels mm -hmm. heard and feels witnessed and knows that there's a future there for them. So I, I um, and as someone who does use they, them pronouns, I, I had to write it in there. And then also use pronouns that weren't she, he, and they. And I had to use uh, it because I know people with those pronouns. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in relationship with these people with these pronouns. And also as indigenous people, these pronouns just also aren't ours. They're, they're a colonial languages and structures. And mm -hmm. um, as I'm actually working this short story into a novel, I'm now exploring that idea of breaking away from those pronouns as gender representation, because we are only queer in the colonial sense, pre-contact, mm -hmm. we, we, we were who we were and there was no, no like other about it we were the storytellers we were everything and nothing at the same time and I I love that idea of chaos in that sense and for me this was an opportunity to ensure that I I see the next generation and I'm here for the next generation um because as like a young queer indigenous foster kid I thought I was all alone like I thought I was the only mm. the only one. Oh my god mm. and like obviously we're on a panel with all queer indians like oh my god like that is 
like worlds apart from like you know 10 10 years ago so mm -hmm. i i want to make sure that this work lives long enough um that there are children who just know that they're never alone oh. yeah thanks jane mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it is revolutionary i think that we have this um that we have all three of you and the contributors here and that we have like queer and trans and non-binary indigenous writing in the world and we have these representations um and the work that you do is so important um and the lives that you like politically live are so necessary so i can only say like thank you mm. and we're yeah uh thanks for sharing jay yeah yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. It really made me consider um, the asterisks beside uh, the, the pronoun, right, the they. And it reminded me of um, all the ways that in, in the work I do, like there's um, an interrupting of a, a narrative that we do a lot, like a self-talk, something that we've, we've internalized, um, whether from our families or the you know, society or whatever, um, in order to cultivate a new narrative, you know. Um, and so, I, you know, I was just reading it through again. And, and even for me, I was like, oh, this is a bit disruptive for even for me to, to see they so many times, um, just as one of the pronouns that you could put in there. Um, <laughs> yeah. And again, yeah, like agreeing with Jay that it is um, a colonial, you know, uh, placeholder, I suppose, a colonial, colonial narrative. Um, you know, because I think in many of our cultures, right, like um, there, there are gender neutral terms that we use um, uh, that might not make sense if you aren't, you know, in the context of using them. Um, and then there's so many nicknames we get, you know, and there's so many ways that we get referred to that aren't using pronouns um, uh, and, and they grow with us. So I just I like how they're um, they're constantly changing and growing. Right, like I, I had all these names growing up, and then I have, you know, the name I have now, and I imagine it'll change in the future. You know, that's just something we can um, uh, look forward to is that we're always changing. Um, um, uh, and and you know, for folks who are Navajo speakers and readers, or Diné speakers and readers, um, the just even the subtle shift of who gets named what. Um, would be enough for them to be like, wait a minute, that's not often how we address women, like cis women. Um, uh, even the the word hashke, like that's reserved for cis men, um, usually uncles who um, get after all the kiddos, right? And <laughs> when they get act out of line. So I was like, huh, let's put that on a cis woman's like name and have her be the one doing that, right? Mm. Um, so that's an interesting thing. And then also like, add like, in, you know, in the net is kin, right? Kinship. Um, and so we, we know that that is genderless, right? You, you, you're um, a grandparent, you're a child, right? You're a, a caregiver, right? You're an ancestor, all these things. Um, and generally those don't have genders unless you assign them. And if, you know, Dine is also gendered and also you can go back and forth between the two. Um, yeah, and, and that also, lets people know how you're identifying yourself too. Um, and also how people identify you um, and how they accept you, right? Um, so yeah, I think there's a, a practice of disrupting a narrative that, that's in the story. Um, it might be annoying at first or might be like, okay, I get it that this person's a they, you know? Um, uh, and then also just even having to use um, uh, a slightly skewed name for someone who wouldn't have that name is also disruptive, I believe. Um, so just all these ways that you can really begin to in, um, push back on things that would be considered traditional, right? I, I always critique what's considered traditional now because a lot of the strains of it are Christian, are, fav you know, are um, uh, privileging men, cis men are privileging um, uh, heterosexuality, privileging Christianity, 
uh, privileging so many things, right? Imperialism, you know, um, so that we're just, um, it, it's, it's important, I think, to really disrupt that. And I'll just end with my wife and I were on a walk earlier and some lovely folks um, put a bunch of um, messages all up and down our lake walk, like uh, along the, uh, the pavement, pavement there. Just really beautiful reminders to people, right? Like um, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, lobster. Um, it's not about the lobsters, it's about genocide. Um, uh, MMIWG2S, uh, um, you know, ACAB, all those sorts of things. Um, uh, landlords are parasites, <laughs> just all these sorts of things. I'm like, <laughs> yes, you know, you're on stolen land, right? All these things. Um, and I was like, yeah, because folks who normally walk there, um, they're literally not paying to see that, right? Because we're in a suburb in, the, in Scarborough, but you're going to have to see it. And some courageous folks took time out of their day or night, you know, <laughs> to um, do that public service um, and to really remind everyone to be like, hey, we're still here, right? We're queer, um, we're indigenous, we're black, you know, all these things. Um, and we're going to remind you that, um, uh, yeah, that we're, we're, we're going to fight um, and, and that we're, we're not going anywhere. You know, and I think that also lives in our writing as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. I think um, the the question of well, I don't I don't know how to talk about style, but um, uh, <laughs> you got tons of it though. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I I think that that it was really important for me to to think about the, the idea of having having history or not having history. And I, we're, we're still in such a hangover from um, modernism where people want to just, you know, clear the land, smash everything down and start from scratch. And so having, I mean, you talked about not liking the character of Thora in the story, but she's a character who really I think as many queer people do, and particularly white queer people, um, is really empowered by the idea that we can just we can just level everything to the ground and we can build ourselves a new utopia. You know, I think that that is something that's really exciting for her. Um, and and you know, Thora's partner M uh, carries all that history with them and isn't able to just you know. Cl clear away all that history and, and start from scratch. And I think that that's a lot of, um, I guess, what's at the, the heart of like the, the, the queerness or the indigeneity of that story is just, tr is, is confronting all of those things with all of that history, all of those ancestors attached consistently through, you know, in, 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 in every time, every moment that she, has or uh, every moment that, that they have they're bringing that that um yeah that knowledge and that history and that experience with them and that it's impossible to sever those things even even as an idea even as a fantasy or a dream of, of the future you can't leave that that history behind oh no, I, yeah i love this um it's very much it's like we're, umbilically tied to where we come from, the stories we tell, right? The bodies are always intertwined like that. Mm. We have, do have a couple of Q&As from the, from the audience. Uh, my dear friend, Derek, is, I think this is for Jay, but if you can recall the ingredients of a Vanjie cocktail, please do share. <laughs> <laughs> I do not recall. <laughs> Me neither. I just I remember it was the very pleasure. sweet. <laughs> Um, and we go up on here, uh, and this commentator writes, Buju, within your stories, how does the indigenous futurisms correlate with our current world's process with two-spirit history or two-spirit visibility, revitalization, and expression? Are things different within your stories, new cultures or traditions and expressions that come full circle from pre-contact systems to indigenous futurisms? Um, so yeah, thinking about indigenous futurisms, how does that correlate with the current world that we are situated within? Are things, yeah, are things different within your stories? I think I'll jump in because, uh, and I'll be quick because uh, we have limited time. 
um, is at the beginning of my short story, the, the protagonists who are living in the wilds, as I call it, are surviving by indigenous knowledge purely. And that's how they're staying alive. And that's how they're actually uh, doing much better than a lot of the other folks. Um, but the, the caveat is that uh, the government is pretty anti-queer and that's how they aren't forced into some of the other labors that are uh, put onto uh, their other kin. And so it's like a mix of that, but I, um, and there's comments on some of the traditions and ceremonies that we typically participate in are no longer because there's just no resources to participate in it. Um, and then there's hinting at the future on this new planet, which I see as a return. But a big thing is like, how do we build a relationship with this land? And the joke is like any relationship you ask them out. And it's that, that work is being done in that relationship is being done in the bringing over of things as a gift is 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 monumental definitely and also i love that how do we build a relationship <laughs> with this new world <laughs> such a good little ending line yeah so i did get a little permission to go a little over this one more question but the organizer okay. said go ahead this is such a rich conversation so this is the last one we have which comes from Glenn. So I can't wait to read this entire anthology. Thank you all. Drawing inspiration from a recent panel of authors discussing queer black joy, I'd like to know your take on indigiqueer or queer slash 2S joy um, as a subversive act or as a tool of political disruption. So thinking about our joy as two-spirit folks, queer indigenous folks, trans indigenous folks. <laughs> I'll, I'll just preface because I remember I was having a conversation with Tennille Campbell who's a photographer uh, and the, her online handle is Sweet Moon, Sweet Moon Photography um, and she's we were doing the headshots and she was like okay Josh stop trying to look so stoic and deadly she's like it's really important that we see indigenous joy too and that was something that I hadn't really like really I guess entertained the idea of um, of always trying to be like steadfast and holding on hard and like wanting to be disruptive, but also like my joy can also be just as disruptive, right? Mm -hmm. It just reminds me of um, like all the jokes we tell, right? Um, with, with friends, um, especially with people who know your language, you know, like my siblings and I, when we get together, we're just like laughing all the time and that nourishes me so much, you know? Um, but yeah, I love all the fun memes that come across <laughs> Facebook, <laughs> all the ways that we drag aunties and uncles, you know, and all the things they do. <laughs> um, and even dragging politicians, you know, um, using indigenous humor, right? And we all get it. We're like, oh, yeah, like, I, I totally get that, um, uh, that meme that's being put out there. I can't think of one right now. But, um, but yeah, I think it's really, it comes down to humor. Um, and just given all the the ridiculous things that we've had to live through and are living through. Like, I feel like that's the resilience practice. I think for many of us is really just how do we put that weight down for a bit, have a good laugh at, at ourselves and others um, with each other, you know, and, and laugh, you know, about, you know, the orange devil down South. Um, uh, and yeah, um, I really, I feel like, and then you can go back to your world and, you know, really be with the reality of what's there, but, yeah, just uh, like I really have such a soft spot for folks who, you know, can tell a good joke and do a good meme and, and do a good drag of someone um, like that just that's awesome. So I, I feel like that's a big part of where my joy is. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think we can all recall like Indian Baby Yoda, like that yeah. was <laughs> for me. Yeah. I have, I have a baby the, Yoda. Ah, oh, yes, yes, Jay I does. need to get a Baby Yoda. Oh. I mean, I... Ooh, yeah, that's cool. I love that. That's cool. Yeah, <laughs> I just think about yeah, laughing and eating and fucking, and mm -hmm. I just want more <laughs> yeah. indigenous laughter, eating and fucking in like exactly. everything that we make and everything that we do, and I, you know, have to say that the things that I have uh, made have not had enough of those things in them, and. Uh, and 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 I would I would love to see more of that in the work that all of us create because that joy 
is so important. And you know, when I when I'm looking at um, all kinds of content that's coming from from our communities, it it is like I I I get the many reasons why this is the case, but it, it is unfortunate sometimes that that joy isn't represented as well as you know, when we walk into a room, into a gathering, and you hear that laughter, you know, you mm -hmm. see some like big belly shaking, and you just like, <laughs> and you just feel good, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I look, I look forward to a time when there is a lot more of the many shades of, of all that in, in the work that we're making. I love that trio, all three at the same time. I'm in. Adam, you can write the next bear topping scene for Indigenous Lit or someone. Can. <laughs> it's no, that's on you. Ever. You're the you're the only right now. You're the only. <laughs> I think um, for queer to us joy, like I was raised by the aunties in all the halls. Right, that is something that precedes me. Is is the laughter, and I always got told as a kid that I had a. A cook em laugh and I didn't understand what that meant for a very long time but I have the same laugh as my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother and I think that's that's disruptive to mm. the narrative that we're sad and we're broken and we're depressed and like although we look real mean stoic and deadly there are <laughs> there are these moments where like I get told all the time they're like what are you laughing at and I was like you won't get it Monia like like you won't get it like there's just things you can't explain and like at Banff I tried to teach my cohort that Tagai meant uh until we meet again and <laughs> <laughs> and you know the other Cree in the room was like don't you dare and I was like yes, <laughs> Tagai <laughs> you know? it's kind of that raunchy raunchy like you know mm. like let's say this this awful word means something else and <laughs> the ability to laugh and shout and like you know is, is is what keeps us alive and I think what keeps us alive is inherently radical mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I love that and like we were, we were crying we're laughing like we have this huge range and I would say even thinking about generations oh and on this is that even our laughter it contains multitudes generational multitudes right like we laugh like our mothers our grandmothers we oh, laugh like those bingo hall aunties we <laughs> laugh uh and uh, that laughter is like a summoning of temporality too I would even say mm -hmm. I love that well I just want to thank you three so much thank oh. you for joining me tonight thanks for your stories your insights your joy uh, and I hope we can all cross paths again soon. I do want to thank um, Auto Writers Fest and everyone who's been staying with us and joined us this evening. Uh, so thank you for joining us and to our partners who made this happen, the Ottawa International Writers Festival, Ottawa Public Library, and the Library and Archives Canada. Mm -hmm. I also do just want to plug the next event with, uh, with Ottawa Writers Fest is next Monday, October 26th, 7.30 p.m. again, and it will be the 17th annual Bywords John New Love Poetry Awards ceremony. So stay tuned. Um, make sure to check out these, this book, check out their works. Lots of love. Mm. All medicine. Thank you so here. much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Miigwech. Thank you. Bye. Time. Until we meet again. Yes. And don't go around saying to guy. <laughs> <laughs>